for many of us, I, I don't think we're aware of how how much we guard ourselves against um, the threat of what might be to come by not fully uh, by not fully inhabiting the joys and the beauties of our lives. But if you start if you if you see it all as mixed up together and it's all part of the same road, you don't have to feel as guilty or as defended um, against really embracing those joys. This episode is brought to you in part by our friends at WeWork. Uh, hi, I'm Susan Kane. I am an author and a speaker. Um, I wrote a book called Quiet, the Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking that was crazily on the New York Times bestseller list for something like eight years and um, translated into over 40 languages. And I now have a new book called Bittersweet, How Sorrow and Longing Make Us Whole. And very excited about it. I've been working on it for years and years and years, as is my way. Uh, and I hope you love it. Hey, and you are listening to and watching Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. Hey everyone, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another episode of the show. Susan, welcome. Thank you so much. It's so great to be here with you after all these years. I know. I can't believe it. I feel like um, I've stayed connected to you through your uh, your books. I'm so excited for this new book. Um, but I just feel like even though we're sort of East Coast, West Coast apart, um, I've somehow stayed connected to you and your work. I'm, I'm such a fan. You changed my life when you wrote the book Quiet because you really helped educate the world about us introverts and... Um, our place in the world that we have a place and we have a voice, even though you can't always hear us in the back of the room or in the front of the room. Um, but I usually ask my guests, how did you get this job? How did you get here? Well, I've wanted to be a writer since I was four years old. And so I took a, de a detour of a bunch of decades, I guess. I mean, I, I always thought I was going to be a writer, but then when I got to college, started thinking, well, those were just the sort of impractical dreams of youth. And so I went to law school and became a corporate lawyer for almost 10 years. And, um, and then had a kind of sort of radically cinematic epiphany moment where um, I left my law firm all at once. That's a whole story in and of itself. And I thought that I would take a year off or so and go traveling the world. But literally within 24 hours of leaving my 16 hour a day job and suddenly my life opening up again, I found myself writing, which was something I at that time had not thought about in almost a decade. And, uh, and I signed up for a class in creative nonfiction writing at NYU and sat there in that class on the first night and knew I had come home and have never left home since. That's amazing. I want to unpack that. Um, and, but before we do, I want to go back to your, your, your lawyer days. And I ask this with context because in my mind, I'm definitely oversimplifying and, uh, and making this easy, but I, I look at two camps of people right now. One, they're, uh, young people coming out of school it could be high school or it could be college and they're trying to figure out what to do with their lives. And, uh, they want to know, you know, what do I want to be when I grow up? The other camp is this great resignation that's been happening where you could be um, mid-career or even uh, middle age and you're not happy in what you're doing and you're taking advantage of this time in history where it's possible to completely hit the reset button. And so I like to identify signals because I think uh, sometimes they're overt and sometimes they're subtle. We, we could miss them or sometimes like you, it takes 10 years to kind of listen to that inner voice telling you what your next chapter is going to be. But what was it that led you to law in the first place? Um, was it parental pressure? Was it like I just gravitated towards the law? What kind of law did you do? Did you litigate or are you more writing contracts for, on the corporate side? Talk about that. Uh, yeah, I was a corporate lawyer, so I did contract uh, drafting but also negotiation. And what led me to it, I... Um, yeah, you know, my father sat me down one day and said, you know, it's really nice to dream of being a writer and I get it, but it's no fun to be um, someone, you know, he said that's really nice when you're 17, but when you're 30 and 40 and you can't pay the bills, it's not going to feel that great. And as he said it, I was resisting fiercely, but 
I was also thinking at the back of my mind, well, you know, he kind of has a point. Um, and so the practical side of me rose up, which I don't think was a bad thing. We can talk about that. Um, so I went to law school and I, I really was the most unlikely lawyer in so many ways, but I actually ended up loving law school. I found it completely intellectually fascinating. Um, and my first few years of practicing law, I also really loved too, partly because it was just such a kick. I was, you know, it was just the last thing I ever expected to be doing. I didn't know the difference between a stock and a bond when I started. And suddenly my clients were all these Wall Street wizard types. I didn't understand what the heck they were saying for the first year. Um, but yeah, I just got a kick out of the whole thing at first. At first, being the key word. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think there, that that kind of practical advice, you know, uh, starving art, you know, the fear of being the starving artist or, you know, doing something that's risky is is difficult. Um, but I can see how you like law because I like it too. It's, uh, it's somewhat... Um, Structure, but then it's also philosophical, where you have some creativity or some leeway to be creative and interpret. Um, so that's very interesting. And so then what happened? So you, you got into it and you were loving it and then you weren't loving it. Yeah, I mean, at a certain point, it's hard for anybody to love it, first of all, because you're working like a maniac, you know, 16 hour days, weekends, you never, you can't plan anything because you never know and you'll have to work. Um, but also, it really was not who I was. And in terms of like, you know, what signs should people be paying attention to who might be listening? I, I actually write about this in the book because a lot of, of this new book, Bittersweet, is about the state not only of sorrow, but also of longing. Okay, and so for me, the whole time that I was a lawyer, I had this dream that I was longing for. And the dream was that I would one day live in a beautiful Greenwich Village townhouse, like a red brick townhouse in this neighborhood, a particular part of Greenwich Village where the streets were were lined with, you, you felt everywhere the ghosts of the artists and the writers who had lived there in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, the streets were lined with plaques dedicated to them. Edna St. Vincent Millay, the poet, had lived there. And I just really wanted to live in that place and in one of those homes and and that in retrospect was a symbol and then the other thing that happened um, as soon as I left law I left the wrong I left my law firm and then I left a, a seven-year relationship that I had been in all kind of at the same time and when that happened I I fell into a kind of obsessive relationship with a lyricist and musician um, and and it was one of those you know obsessions that you can't get your mind out of and I talked to and and I confided in, in a friend about it and I would always you know be regaling her with with stories of him and and one day she looked at me and she said you know if you're this obsessed it's because he represents something that you're longing for what are you longing for and and the, it was like the second she said it, I realized I was longing for the writing life. And he represented that to me because he lived in this world of, of words and music and art. And it was the world I had wanted to live in all along. At that time in my life, I knew very few people from that world because everyone I knew was a banker or a lawyer. And, and he represented that life for me and, and that home in Greenwich Village that I had always wanted to live in that represented that life for me and I it was like it was clear that the an the question is what are you longing for and, and pay attention to it because you're longing for it for a reason it's telling you something yeah I, I'm getting goosebumps right now listening to you talk about that um I love that idea and so how insightful of your friend and what a gift yeah. what a gift um such a gift I actually have goosebumps now remembering it because um, yeah, it was one of those moments. It, it was the craziest thing. The minute she said it, the obsession was gone. I was no longer obsessed with him because um, I, I saw it all clearly. I still loved him, but not in that obsessive way and uh, and completely shifted gears and 
really started writing seriously and oriented my whole life around writing from that moment on. How do you define the word longing? I mean, I have a sense of it. I kind of feel it in my heart. But what is your definition? My definition is, I mean, the the writer C.S. Lewis calls it the inconsolable longing for we know not what. And I have been for the years that I years and years and years that I've been writing and researching this book, I have been on the path of this longing. I've been looking at our wisdom traditions, psychology, neuroscience, everything. And what I've come to realize is the most fundamental aspect of humanity is the longing for a more perfect and beautiful world. And we express that in a thousand different ways. Um, you know, religions express it through the longing for Mecca or, or Zion or um, in the Sufi tradition, it's the longing for the beloved of the soul. Um, you know, the Wizard of Oz expresses it as somewhere over the rainbow. Like the, the thing we're longing for is over there. Creative people express it through, um, they see a gap between that which way they desire and that which is. And the whole reason we're creative in the first place is because we're, <laughs> we, we're propelled to fill that gap in whatever way we are given to do it. And it's going to look different for every individual. But what isn't different, what we all share, is a longing for somewhere over the rainbow. Yeah, I love that. Um, it makes me think, is it the Thoreau quote? You know, most men live lives of quiet desperation. It's sort of somewhat connected to that, right? That's, I guess the, that's the other side. If we, if we never take action or we never get in touch with our feelings of what is it that we're longing for, if we can't really put our finger on it, then we stay quiet and, um, you know, we don't achieve what we want to do. How did you arrive at this, this concept? Was there an event or something that propelled you into this? So there's a, a very deep familial reason, and then there's a question I've been trying to answer all my life. And maybe I'll start with the question. The question was, all my life I have been drawn to minor key bittersweet music. Uh, Leonard Cohen is my patron saint. Um, you too? <laughs> yeah, like that song, Hallelujah. I, like I've been listening to that song for decades. And when I was actually still in law school, some friends came to my dorm room to pick me up for class. We were all going to go to class together. And this would, was in the early 90s. And I was blasting out probably Leonard Cohen on my stereo speakers. And my friends were like, why, why are you listening to this funeral music? They asked. And I laughed and we went to class. But I thought about that question for the next 25 years. The question of, number one, why was... Why is it a funny why is it in our culture a funny joke to be listening to music like that? But more to the point, what is it about that music? Because you probably know this, that music does not I'm, I'm I'll ask you if you have this reaction too. That kind of music does not make me feel sad. It makes me feel uplifted. It gives me joy. Um it makes me feel like a kind of awe that a musician could transform the sorrow and pain that all humans must know into something that beautiful. Um, and you feel kind of, you feel connected with all of humanity because the music is expressing joy and sorrow all at once. It's exp sorrow and beauty all at once. And you know that all humans know these states. And, and so it's a, a kind of like precious transcendent communion. And I have always felt this, but I felt like I really needed to understand it. And it became this years long quest of, of studying our wisdom traditions, our psychology, our neuroscience. I went to talk to Pete Doctor, the, the Pixar director who made the movie Inside Out about the value of sadness. Um, I went all over the place. <laughs> and, um, and it's like it started out as just as, that I needed to know the answer to a seemingly narrow question of why do we listen to sad music, but it ended up becoming much more of a spiritual quest and a quest about how we should live and how we should work 
and how to understand mortality. And what is it that you discovered? Well, um, I discovered that these states that we don't necessarily want to inhabit, but that we do, these states of sorrow and longing, which are part of life experience, are one of the great gateways that we have to creativity and to connection and love. And we are living in a time, I mean, in a, in a hopelessly divided time, right? And also in a time that tells us not to express that that aspect of human experience. And what, and it's, and it's a waste of a hidden power because if we could freely be accessing these states, it would be able to bring us together and bring us to joy and creativity um, in a way that is not currently available to us as much as it should be. And this is especially true in the workplace, but it's true all over. No, I like that you say that. I, it's sort of been a thread that's run through a, a lot of these talks that I've had recently with a very eclectic group of people one of them I can think is um, the lead singer for Imagine Dragons, if you know that group, Dan Reynolds. Oh, wow. I sure do. Yeah. And, and Dan has this song that says, It's Okay Not to Be Okay, uh, where you know, he talks about his own depression, his own demons, um, the things that he's grappled with. And, you know, sort of the aha moment for me over the last few years has been that this is just part of it. You know, I've sort of was raised to feel that um, you know, being depressed or, or even melancholy, sad, um, or these feeling having bittersweet feelings was negative. And I think you're completely on point with how valuable sitting with these feelings can be because my tendency has been to push them down or, you know, um, I'm very good at compartmentalizing. I put it in a compartment and I store it away. Sometimes I lock it away and it's deep. And I throw away the key and you'll never see it. And I just keep soldiering on. Um, but I found that sitting with these feelings and, um, and also when I've had deep sorrow, um, not just bittersweet feelings, but like honest, traumatic, sorrowful feelings, that that's also really healthy to, to dance with. And um, I don't think it's something I ever get over but I've just learned to, you know, use it to my benefit. What are your thoughts? My thoughts are, it is so clear to me, having watched your career, that your work, the work that you put into the world would not exist, but for those um, experiences you've had that have led you to these states or but for these states themselves. Um, it is so clear. And like what I always say to people is, Whatever pain you can't, or I say this in the book, I guess I should say, whatever pain you can't get rid of, like make that your offering, your creative offering. And it's so, I don't think anybody could watch your work without knowing that. And the same thing is true when you listen to Imagine Dragons. Um, you don't even have to think about it. You know it on a heart level. You hear that music, you know it's infused with joy, but also with sorrow. You just know it. Um, and then I guess the final thing I would say is you say that you've always been given that message. I mean, that those feelings were not okay. Well, you and everybody else, that is one of the problems of our culture. We are all getting that message. Um, and then wait, sorry, I'll say one final thing, which is I think it's really important to make a distinction between depression and melancholy because, or depression and bittersweetness. Um, depression, while extremely prevalent is not a state I would wish on anyone. And I would say to anybody listening, you know, if you're feeling depressed to please seek help. And, and, and my, my point is not in any way to like glorify depression. It's extremely painful. I believe the issue is that we do not have in our culture a way of distinguishing between depression, which is a kind of emotional black hole, um, and melancholy, which is a normal part of human experience and one of one of the best parts of what one, one of the most generative parts of human experience. And I, I, I as part of my research, I actually delved into the psychological research to see if psychology was even noticing this difference. And the difference has been there for thousands of years. Um, you know, 
but but we've lost it in in very recent times. So Aristotle, two thousand years ago, asked the question of why it is that so many of the great philosophers, politicians, and poets of his age were melancholic by nature. He he's been wondering about this ever since then, um, and yet you look at modern psychology. You, that's all erased, you know. The, the difference between a, a generative productive melancholy versus an unseating depression. Um, you, you don't see, we don't have a language for it. So I wrote this book to bring back that language. Yeah. And you talk about the philosophers. I think about the stoic movement, you know, this Latin phrase, amor fati, right? Which is basically, you know, things don't happen to you. They happen for you. So you have to love, you know, the good, bad and the ugly, or at least, um, if you're not loving it, you can use it to your benefit, even if it's terrible and tragic and painful. You know, it's like this happened. It was a complete shit sandwich. Um, but now what? You know, how can you now use this? And I think of the metaphor in my mind is like judo. This enemy is charging towards you with great speed and force. And the whole idea behind judo that I know of is you use that force against your opponent and you, you know, flip them over. So that's kind of at least what I try to do with my, the feelings that are not pleasant. Um, Talk about, if you can, uh, if you can go into it, talk about your, your personal family experience and how that's helped you kind of develop this, um, this narrative and, and how it's helped you. Well, I guess I would say that um, I come from a family background, generations, probably centuries old of love and loss. Um, And this is on my mother's side and my father's side. You know, so many of the members of my family were killed in the Holocaust and in the generations before that, too. So we actually have very little family left. Um, And though my generation obviously wasn't directly touched by that, there's a way in which in which these experiences ripple from one generation to the next. And that's one of the things I talk about in the book is, is the whole question of inherited grief and how, how we inherit grief or pain from previous generations, not only um, culturally and through familial practice, but also epigenetically. Like the, we, we seem to be inheriting it on a physical level as well. Um, so I th- I, I, it's got to be that because of that legacy, I came into this world, even though I had a, a very lucky and happy childhood, I have always kind of in the background had a sense of the potential tragedy in life right alongside its beauty. Like to me, those two things have always coexisted. And it's not just to me, it turns out. I mean, the reason I wrote a book called Bittersweet is because I, I realized that it is the nature of the human condition that light and sorrow, uh, I'm sorry, that light and dark, joy and sorrow must always go together. Um, There's an amazing Arabic expression, days of onion, days of honey. Um, And, but there's also something about this that if you're, if you're properly tuned into it, it makes you just intensely aware of life's beauties and can really lead you to a generative state. Um, and then, as I was writing this book, just over the last couple of years during the time of COVID, because I started writing it, I don't know when, let's say 2015 or something like that, but um, but during COVID, I, I actually lost my father and my brother to COVID quite early on in the pandemic. I'm sorry. And thank you. And there was a way in which having immersed myself in not just these ideas, but this state of being was actually incredibly helpful for dealing with that moment, ongoing moments, because one of the greatest teachings that I learned through my research, it comes from the Kabbalah, which is the Jewish, um, which is the mystical aspect of Judaism. And one of the teachings is that 
that originally all of creation was one intact divine vessel, but that at a certain point the vessel shattered and that the world we're living in now is after the shattering and these divine shards of light are kind of buried all around us, in the mud all around us. And the job of life, our task is to pick up the shards, you know, knowing that the world is always going to be imperfect from here on out, but the shards are there. And you, Brian, see one type of shard. I see another. Somebody listening sees some other shard that, to me, I wouldn't even notice. It would just look like the mud. We all pick up our own. And, um, and when my father died, I started thinking about his life through this metaphor because my father had been someone, he'd been a really amazing doctor and medical school professor, and he worked really hard and was great at it. But he was also performing what I can always, what I can only describe as senseless acts of beauty. Um, I'll just, a couple of examples, like he, he would grow orchids in the basement just because he loved orchids. He like built this whole greenhouse full of them and, and, and grew these orchids for no other purpose than to just gaze at their beauty um, and he learned to speak French even though he had no time to visit France like ever uh, you know once or twice but he just loved the sound of the language so he learned it and there are a million things like this that he did and I started to realize that these were his shards that he had gathered up throughout his life um, and that understanding gave me an extremely deep peace it's it's really you know it's making the best of it, isn't it? You know, when we're not denying that bad things happen and we're not um, run running away from these experiences, but we are moving forward and we're making the best of it, right? As, as, that's sort of the idea. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's also, I, I think, a kind of understanding that we, okay, we're basically taught that... Um, we're basically taught that that the main path in life is when everything's going well, and then the challenges that we face along the way are detours from the main road. And I am proposing a completely different vision in which they're all the main road. They're all the main road. And looking at it that way completely transforms our reaction when these things happen. Because we're not like, we're no longer railing against it. Like part, part of what's so difficult when, when bad things happen is the feeling like it wasn't supposed to be this way. You know, like why me? Why did this happen? It wasn't supposed to be. Instead of understanding this is all, this is all it. Brene Brown has this great, you know, um, take on the man in the arena quote, you know, the Roosevelt quote. And she yeah. talks in great lengths that, hey, if, you're, if you want to live this life and you jump in the arena, guess what? You're gonna get beat up. It's it's not if it's just when, and so it's just part of it, like you say, and and I really I feel your heart when you talk about your dad. I lost my dad um, in 2019 very unexpectedly, and if you know my backstory, you know we were we didn't know each other for 30 years. Um, and we were reuni reunited. We had about four years together, and I was really excited to get to know him. And 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 then all of a sudden, he went in for back surgery and um, got an infection, and he was he was gone. And it was like the rug got pulled right out from under me. And your book has really helped me a lot, kind of crystallize my feelings on this. Um, there is a significant amount of sorrow, sadness, uh, you know, grief that I feel, but I also feel like it's bittersweet because we, we did have this precious time together and I cherish that now. Um, and I'm so glad I don't have regrets, you know, that we, even though our time was short, four years out of my entire life um i feel like that's so valuable then to reflect on that and i i almost feel like um those feelings carry on now and have an influence on the way i see the world in general which is to remind me not to take things for granted or um 
you know, life is, remind me that life is short and precious and um, that I also have a renewed sense of almost, you know, living better for him, if that makes sense. You know, I want to, I want to, sure. you know, carry on his legacy um, and create my own, of course, but, and so I really, I really do, I want to thank you for this book. It's just been tremendous. Um, and I think it really is a message that is so important to recognize. A lot of people might be just kind of quietly suffering in silence, not knowing that it's okay to sort of lean into these, um, what people might tag as negative feelings, but they're so beneficial. And I think the only re way to really heal is to to talk about it or write about it or share it with someone you trust and love. There's lots of different ways to to cope. Or turn it into um, trying to heal others who have gone through something similar is also really helpful. Um, but the, the other thing I would say about really accepting all of this as part of the main road is that it also frees us, I believe, to open up to joy and to beauty because For many of us, I, I don't think we're aware of how how much we guard ourselves against um, the threat of what might be to come by not fully uh, by not fully inhabiting the joys and the beauties of our lives. But if you start if you if you see it all as mixed up together and it's all part of the same road, you don't have to feel as guilty or as defended um, against really embracing those joys because you know that the joys also are fleeting uh, the sufferings are fleeting the joys are fleeting like it, it's all fleeting um, and and looking at it that way can really open you up to experiencing it all if anyone out there listening or watching is like me i fell into this victim trap right i, f I fall into it all the time actually it's sort of a reoccurring theme that i i have to remind myself uh you're not you're not always a victim. Sometimes you are, <laughs> but um, the victim trap is, is you know, why me? Why not him or her? You know, um, you start comparing yourselves. And you're right. When you realize that this is just the road, <laughs> then you're just like everybody else. Every, you know, we all go through this. I would never want to compare scars with anyone because people have much more significant pain and trauma and things compared to what I've gone through. I feel very privileged in that respect. But, you know, I, there's no need to compare when you just realize that this is your road. Maybe for, you know, people who are wrestling in the professional life, whether, whatever, what other advice could you give, Susan? Yeah, I, I, so I guess the first thing I would say, and then we'll talk about concrete ways to address this, but the first thing I'd say is to be aware of just all the subtle ways that in our workplaces um, we're, we're subtly asked not to have full human experiences. Uh, there was one study done by the psychologists Jason Kanoff and Laura Madden and um, in, in which a whole group of, of people from different workplaces ex talked about different experiences they had had on the job and in some cases, they were describing very frightful experiences, very difficult experiences. And they, but they found that they would, when they were describing a situation in which they had, in fact, felt anxious, they would label it as anger. And when they had, in fact, felt sad, they would label it as frustrated. And I think we all know that. You know, we have a very, um, a very narrow and impoverished. Uh, suite of emotions that we are expected to experience when we are at work. So what do we do about that? I have a few different ideas for us. Um, one is the act of expressive writing. So the UT professor, his name is James Pennebaker, did this incredible series of, of studies where he found that the simple act of writing down your troubles has beyond belief transformative effects. It, he found better health conditions, like people who did this had lower blood pressure, they had more success at work, they felt more at peace, um, just as, a, as an example. 
There was one study where a group of 50-year-old laid off very depressed engineers. Um, He took this group of people and half of them, he asked them every day to write down their troubles or what was bothering them. Not for anyone to read, just for them to write it down. You could throw it away when you're done. And then the other half were asked, just write down what you're wearing, write down what you wrote for breakfast that day, you know, so kind of meaningless stuff. And it turned out that the ones who, the engineers who had written down their troubles were significantly more likely to have gotten a new job several months later. They had lower blood pressure. They had better health outcomes. Um, their lives righted themselves in contrast to the others. It's kind of like the, the findings are so, are so amazing that you can't believe it's true. So my number one thing is to advise us all to get into the habit of writing things down. It's called expressive writing. And we could do this with our teams by just having a team practice where you know, every day at the start of the day, three minutes, let's just write things down. Don't show it to anyone. Just do it. Um, then there's another practice, which I would say is, what are your captions? What are other people's captions? Okay, what do I mean by this? The Cleveland Clinic created a video several years ago that went unexpectedly viral. It was meant originally just for the caregivers at the clinic to help teach them empathy. And in this video, it basically took you through the corridors of the hospital with the camera kind of lingering briefly on the faces of random passersby. You know, the people who in normal life, you just walk past without thinking twice, except in this case, they showed captions um, that showed you what the people were going through. And in some cases, they were joyful. It would be like, you know, just found out he's going to be a father for the first time. But because it was a hospital, they were not always joyful. So like one of them was um, a little girl and the caption read, going to say goodbye to her father for the last time. And you watch this video, you know, you you can't help but tear up, but you're also feeling this incredible physical chest opening, like your heart expanding for this random collection of humans who you've never seen before and you suddenly feel deeply connected to them. And and the question is like what how would you how would your life be different if you started imagining what the unwritten captions are underneath each of your coworkers and the the random people you're passing on the street as you walk to work. What are the captions? It's a very transformative exercise. I love this. And um, my, wife and actually, my wife and I actually play this game, especially when we're driving, when someone cuts us off or um, they zoom past us without regard or maybe, you know, do something that they shouldn't have done instead of reacting to that and getting angry, we, we, we make up captions. We say, oh, oh wow. that person probably is on their way to the emergency room with a kidney stone or something. Like we, we make it very specific. <laughs> and because I love this idea of giving them the benefit of the doubt, right? Like, oh, you know, they're probably bleeding internally and they've got to get to someplace. You know, we, we do it jokingly, but I think it's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. That's funny. I actually almost wrote a book called The Benefit of the Doubt because I feel like our society really needs just uh, that mentality in general. Yeah. Well, again, you're spot on. It's like you, you just don't know what's that saying. You don't, you don't know what other people are going through um, for better or for worse, right? And so just to have a little bit of a little bit more kindness, a little bit more compassion, a little bit more empathy, um, that can certainly do a world of good. I love it. Yeah, you don't know. And sometimes the person just is being a jerk. They're just a jerk. And and that's true, too. Um, and, and probably the reason they're being a jerk is because of some other form of, of buried pain. I mean, I, I, I believe that one of the crossroads that we all have in this life is to take whatever pain we have. And, and then there's a kind of fork in the road, right? And you could either bury the pain and take it out on yourself through depression or through um, addiction or something like that, or you can take it out on other people. Um, and then the other thing we can do with pain is transform it into something else, so, some positive and constructive force. And know that we'll probably never fully get there, and that's okay too, but just the act of being engaged in that process is very liberating. I couldn't agree more. So as we sort of bring it home, 
final words of advice, things that you learned from compiling this incredible book? Um, I would say to, tra- as we were saying, to transform pain into beauty or to phrase that a different way, um, whatever pain you find you can't get rid of, make that your offering, your creative offering, your healing offering, your generative productive offering. Um, there's almost always, it, this is not meant to, for those of you who might be experiencing some lacerating pain, it's not meant to minimize it in any way at all. It's just to say, feel it, understand it, and see what you can do with it down the road. Yeah. And speaking personally from my experience, the, that feeling of helplessness when something happens to you that's random or seems unfair, that lack of control, for me at least, it's been a real trigger in my life. And I understand exactly why. But when you're able to then personally decide what to do with it, you, you get that control back. You get to yes. decide what to do next. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, that's made all the difference. That's right. Well, I can really tell that in the way that you live your life. And, uh, and I love how open you've been. And I don't know, there's something about you. I feel like even when you're not discussing your own personal story, uh, you really do radiate a, a kind of openness that is not unrelated to everything we've been talking about and to that which you've experienced. So thank you for that. Mm-hmm.